I want to welcome everyone today to the support webinar, Building a Supportive Network with Dr. Donald Dunn. And Dr. Dunn, if you'll go ahead and flip to the next slide so I can appropriately introduce you. For those of you who don't know Dr. Dunn and what an amazing faculty and really overall Aspen community team member he is, he has his DM in organizational leadership, a bachelor's and master's in education, and over 30 years experience in the consulting industry where he dives into topics like change management, policies, procedures, systems, and such. He's been at Aspen for over 16 years. He's currently full-time faculty in the School of Education. So I know many listeners on the call today know him, know him well. His academic interest, as you'll see today in the presentation that he's giving, is doctor, doctoral students and leadership. And if you know him, you know he is passionate about being known, being known as a good person. So Dr. Dunn, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you. And thank you all for attending. So just very briefly, I want to talk today about who's responsible for your doctoral success. The summary of the doctrinal journey milestones, just so we're all on the same page for where you may be at now and where you're headed. And then I want to point out some tips that will help you if you choose to follow them regarding how to work with your committee, how to make friends and family still friends while you're in your doctoral program, how to, how to use resources. And finally, if there's an opportunity for uh, a cohort, I highly recommend that. So who is responsible for your success? Anybody you want to put that in your chat box? There's usually a little bit of a delay, Dr. Dunn. So I'll let you know when the chats are coming in. We've got people saying, I'm responsible, a student, a faculty member saying the student is responsible. We are, someone said, which probably sounds to me, I'm going to interpret that as the university community as well as the student, but most people on the call today are reporting that it is the student who is responsible for their success. Great. Yes, the student is responsible, but you have a right to expect that the university is here to support you. And we are particularly here at Aspen, probably more so than other universities might be, but our, our, we're very, we're rich in support and capability in our classrooms. So, but I wanted to get that across because at the end of the day, you can fire your chair. I don't necessarily recommend it, but you can do it. And, and your success does depend on you uh, being able to move through the different uh, hoops and bumps and so forth in the road. So I like to think about when we talk about a dissertation journey, I like to try to define it. Um, first of all is the classwork. And I think that those that I've spoken to on the call earlier, uh, many of you are, some of you are getting very close to the end of the classwork. But that part of the dissertation journey is very, is fairly structured compared to the final step. And, and that's why I spend most of my time in concerns for doctoral students surrounding the time when they're no longer in a class. They have classes, but you're on your own deciding what you're going to write about, come up, coming up with your own topics organizing your paper to a certain extent and so forth. And then in the middle, universities all have different kinds of assessment tools that they use to make sure that you understood the comp, you compre comprehensively understood the information from the classwork and as part of uh, providing you with a degree. But the, the primary focus today uh, will be the part of the journey that is what I call, I think most everyone refers to it the same way, 
manuscript writing, which is the last four classes in your curriculum here at Aspen. But I wanted to pause for a moment and make sure that either in the classes you've uh, taken, like human potential or creating change or any kind of motivational cl classes, you've been sort of understanding that there's an external and an internal uh, means by which you're going to have to be, you know, solid to finish, to finish the course. And most of us look at these two elements, extra, extrinsic, which is behaviors that are outside of, you know, maybe you're avoiding punishment or maybe you're receiving a reward. And then that in, intrinsic, which is separate altogether, and it's a sort of an internal satisfaction of some sort for, for being able to finish your doctorate. I'd be interested to see what people think. Do you think that the intrinsic motivation is going to be more important than extrinsic or vice versa? So we'll let everyone navigate over to their chat box and share. Sheila says, absolutely intrinsic, 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 equal amounts we have, which is interesting. That's an interesting response. But most people in the chat box are reporting intrinsic, Dr. Dunn. Clearly there's an extrinsic, I mean, but it's, it's going to be more around if you're in education, completing the doctorate will provide you with a reward or a salary increase or will allow you to interview for jobs where you would be up against doctors, people with their doctorates in as such without one, you're at it, that you're at a, you're minimized in your abilities. But it's the intrinsics that I believe are going to be most important. I, even if you said a combination, I think probably all of you, since you most of you said that, what is it that's going to drive you? And I might ask you to answer that now. For me, you know, I guess to just uh, bear my soul, I had a son, and I went back to school at a, at a later age, and uh, I had a son who had dropped out of college and I felt like maybe I could prove to him that it's never too late to go back. So going back 25 years after I got my master's degree, what was the intrinsic reward? Because I wanted my son to see that happen. Didn't do any good by the way, but it, 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 it was a motivation. The other was my doc, my dad had finished all of his doctoral work. But he fell into that category of all but dissertation. For better reason than today, there was no online education then. He got his work at New York University, and but he would have had to leave upstate New York where we lived and spend time on campus, which would have been difficult to have a family that was that was growing. So those are two of the things that that made me want to do it, and uh, so. I suspect uh, it is both, but I suspect the, the drive that's going to get you uh, there the most when times get tough is going to be the intrinsic. So if you don't have that intrinsic um, motivation or drive, or you haven't thought of some reasons why you will never, never quit, then please work on that. But that's not really something. I can help you with very much. So let's, let's look at the different organizations. I did a study with Aspen students. If you look at the research and I mentioned all the dissertation earlier, 
if you look at the research that's out there, there's four main areas that people blame for quitting and becoming an all but dissertation academic person. Um, and by the way, that's 50% or more of the people that enter their manuscript writing phase, 50% or more never finish. They quit. And without that motivation, without the support network that we're going to talk about now, that it, it's, it's a really hard task to complete. So one of those areas that, that uh, students used as both supportive and not supportive were their, their committee. And here at Aspen, your committee chair is assigned for the most case. I believe there are opportunities for someone to, to request was a chair, but it's, it's an assigned role given to members of the faculty that have been trained and gone through and have experiencing experience being a chair and that assignment, uh, whether you're in the school of nursing or business or education is by the Dean or a, a program director, but the chair is responsible for guiding you, helping you with your proposed topic, understanding the red tape minefields that can, can catch up with you. There's several one way, but one most notable is to be able to do your study. You have to pass the IRB to pass the IRB. There's certain items that have to be done and to submit those items, you have to fill them all right or you lose time. So the chair would be the person in that case that would be giving you those last minute directions and helping you get through that narrowing in the road. Chair is also going to be your first reviewer and uh, typically comes from being a faculty member who's considered a lead faculty member in the doctoral area. And then you've got committee members and here at Aspen, we break them down in two different roles. And it's, it's important to understand the different roles because when you want to put together, so the chair is, is, not, is provided you by name, but your committee members are, are individuals that you see from a list from the school that you are in who have been listed on the list and you're looking at it from two different perspectives. One is the form is called an independent reviewer, but, uh, to break it down, it's the person that can help the most with your methodology and how you are going to go about studying the topic and the questions you're going to ask and the results you expect to get. And then the second is the faculty reviewer, which is focused more on the content, the look and the feel of the, the completeness of your responses. And, uh, and, uh, as a specific, that person is focused more on the literature review. So as a chair, when I have two committee members and when the, the student has chosen their independent reviewer and faculty reviewer. I like to work with the committee members in their areas of expertise or their, their areas that the student gets them to be part of. But your committee is important. Most of your work will be done through your chair, but the committee is open and available. And uh, more and more, I see us involving committee members earlier, but definitely at the end of each of the courses that you take. We should be reviewing your work there. If I can just quickly interject, if you're a doctoral student in the DMP program, those labels are going to look different for you. But everything that Dr. Dunn is saying relates in that you have a committee working with you. So I just didn't want anyone, any of the nursing students out there to potentially be confused by that nomenclature. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
So the question is, on your doctoral journey, are your families, members, and close friends friends or foes? And I mean this sincerely. I think this is one of the most difficult areas for you to manage. When we talked early on, it's up to you to make it successful, and you're going to have to carve out time uh, from that used to be for family and for friends. This is pretty much a full-time journey, and you're already working full-time, many of you or most of you. So you, you picked up a full-time job, and you can't possibly spend the time with families and friends, even though Aunt Mary is going to tell you that Aunt Uncle Joe won't be with us for much longer, and we're going to have a family gathering, and I sure hope you don't mind traveling 400 miles to get there and attend because it would mean so much to the family. There are going to be times where you're going to have to say no to family. I don't suggest you ignore your family. I'm just saying there are, you're going to have to uh, situate uh, your family in a, in a different way than, than you maybe have in the past. I, I, highlight, I highlighted below here, and they'll all get a copy of this presentation, Dr. Frederick. Yes, they will. So this, I, I ran across this article, and I, I think it's, it's smartly done. It is a scholarly article from a journal, and the, site, the reference is on this page. But let me just uh, read through what, what this woman, I think her first name was Karen, but what she says. Understand that a doctor is not easy. We aren't really smart. We just work really hard. There are many highs and lows. Our self-worth is closely aligned with our work. And when things go wrong, it can really feel like the end of the world. Remind us that it isn't actually the end of the world. Remind us that every day is a new day and that today's struggles are a normal part of the scientific process process remind us we are all we are still students encourage us when we are puzzling over protocol or wrangling with how to analyze a new set of data it can help us to overcome our self doubt fan because we often forget that we are skilled enough to be to have been accepted into our program and begin with and please don't ask us when we'll finish of what life after graduate school holds we might not know yet, and that can be scary. We will tell you when we know. There are a lot of unknowns instead. Tell us what they're, tell us you will be there no matter how it turned out. So those are the things that she listed as things she wants to hear from her family and her friends. And as much as you can manage them, it has to happen. This is really the, probably the most important of all of the, the, the uh, dis parts of this discussion. The other is in, it is the, the, I'm sorry, got myself confused here. So you have a responsibility to understand resources. Hopefully you already have spent a lot of time. We have just large amounts of support and resources available to you. And you're attending one right now. So podcasts um, are out there. Now this isn't a podcast. I will tell you that Dr. Frederick has a podcast. And I will also tell you that by searching the web, you're going to find a lot of podcasts where people are giving advice on doctoral studies and in making yourself a success and, and, and books. I hate to blow her home too much. I don't want her head to get too big, but Dr. Frederick just published a book that it is really a great guide for being a happy doc student. 
because that's what we want is happy doc student. Our university library is phenomenal. I was in a class with a student in a co one of my cohorts. There were four members of the cohort. And one of them said they were getting annoyed with the fact that they, they, when they went off to ProQuest or some of these sites, people didn't want to just give the information from their studies. They wanted to sell it for $35. And I chimed in and said, yeah, I mean, there's other places to find information unless there's something really, really important about that. It really is too bad that people do that. But one of the class members said, you could try what I tried. He said, I wrote the university librarian here at Aspen. I told that person that I couldn't get this article. I didn't want to pay the money. And the next morning in my inbox was the article free. So don't be afraid to contact the, don't be afraid to contact the library for help. They put out a lot of helps and they, they're just, they're just great. Then, and then each of the universities here, each of the schools here have their own doctoral lounges dedicated to you. Their forms, there are templates, there are, uh, some of the templates guide you, you know, maybe there's a one page form on how to write a purpose statement or another on how to write a problem statement, but you're your chair, I'm sure has ideas and ways of helping that. So make sure you know your resources and the better you know, the quicker it's going to help you get them. And the other is other dissertations. I was talking with my, my manager, Dr. Bella, just today about this and writing the manuscript is not like going to class. When you go to class, the, the assignment that's due in module five has the topics they want you to cover. You know the book you're going to use. You just have to find two or three or four more resources. You put an introduction ahead of all of that. You talk about what you said you were going to do in the introduction, which is the assignment. You throw a summary at the end and some references and you follow, and you follow APA, you're probably going to get a hundred. It's much, much easier than all of a sudden, even though there is a template for a section that you're writing your dissertation, there's no organization to it. There's, there's no definition of what articles you might choose to use or what books you use. You're completing it on your own and you're writing in a form of very formal scholarly form. So, um, reading other dissertations is, is really important. And uh, I use it with students, for instance, when we get to a section, like, well, I don't know what my assumptions are going to be, or I don't know really what my limitations or delimitations are going to be. Well, those are confusing terms. If you haven't spent much time with it, go to a dissertation and look what someone else has written. You're not going to, you're not plagiarizing because you're on a different topic, but what did they write? What were their assumptions? A lot of the assumptions and the limitations and the delimitations are not going to be very different in terms of their general topic. So know your resources. It's really important. And then my favorite one is a cohort. And anybody that has been around uh, me knows that I have been um, pushing for Formerly having cohorts for quite a while. He had a couple of years ago, we started them in the, the school of nursing definitely has them because I believe, I believe there is a cohort for every class, but not, but very often you become, uh, you have a chair assigned and you're the only student. So the question is, what do you do? Well, first of all, what is a cohort? Somebody just type what you think a cohort is in this context. So I'm navigating here over to the chat box, Dr. Dunn. When I was in graduate school, we called them littermates. So Sheila says a group going through the same experience or the same courses 
Emily concurs, it's a group of students. It is. It's a group. And to a large extent, as I said earlier, when you, when you're going through classes, the people that are in your classes are probably going to enter their dissertation first class at about the same time. So I see when I teach doctoral classes, I see three or four people that I've had before in school that are in the cohort or in the class. And I would suggest that you start to write down some names and email addresses of people that you could get together with, because there's no guarantee you're going to have another person with you in your doctoral courses, but you can create your own cohort because as we said in the very beginning, it's up to you to make it successful. So we, what we want is the benefit of a cohort is that you have networking relationship. You have peers that can read your article, give you ideas on what, what they think you have have written and what they think of it. And so find somebody or some buddies and, uh, and offer to create a cohort where you can exchange information. And uh, so you would find that cohort from classes you, you've been through. You do want to make sure that you're in about the same place. You don't want people in the cohort that are writing the manuscript yet. And ideally, we should probably be sourcing people that are at the same spot, writing chapter one or two or three or four or five. And uh, so the, the cohort engages in discussions about how it's going. Maybe you talk badly about your chair or committee. I don't know. When I, the, the, the cohort is just a way to communicate and get advice and to a large extent, give you somebody to talk to and it's going through the same thing. And um, again, as I said earlier, I think it's a really important part. The study that I had done was done with, with a cohort of mine. All four of these topics that I've just gone through were studied and the decision from that group in the study, the end of that study was that each one of these is equally as important at different times during your, during your jury of writing your manuscript. So in some, it, it's a long journey. You're going to have challenges. You're not going to get everything in on time. You may not always get an A. It may frustrate you. You may get feedback and you're wondering whether you ever went to college because it seems like, you know, the committee member or the chair is really picking on your writing. But those are just bumps in the road or walls that you either have to figure out how to go around or go over. But as we stated at the very outset, you are responsible for completing the doctoral journey. You need the motivation to do so. And I'm hopeful that by surrounding yourself with teams of people following some of the advice I tried to give you, listening to your chair, that you will um, complete the journey. And I thank you for attending for being here and Dr. Frederick, that's the end of my uh, presentation. At each of the doctoral student support webinars, following the presentation, we turn off the recording for an intimate Q&A session. And if you can make it to the webinars live, I encourage you to do so because it is a great way to connect with your peers and engage in candid dialogue with the presenter. The three main themes that emerged from this Q&A period were motivation, communication, and peers. One student shared that the webinar came at the perfect time because he was struggling with motivation. And it's important to remember that the doctoral journey is a marathon, 
not a sprint. So your motivation will ebb and flow. That's totally normal. That's totally natural. It's critical though that you communicate this with your support network so that they can provide the support that you need. It's especially important that you have regular communication with your chair. Even if you're going through a rough patch, you need to be in regular contact. Don't ever go missing in action. And finally, we spoke about the importance of peers and people shared how they were connecting with others. And one of the tips was beyond the classroom, you can find others who are on a similar journey via the university Facebook page and also other social networking platforms like LinkedIn. Be sure to mark your calendars for May 18th, 4 p.m. Pacific time for the next webinar. You will not want to miss this one, Graduate Research in the Library. And as always, be sure to connect with us on your favorite social media platform so you're sure that you don't miss events like this one. See you next month.